I was never a real big basketball fan, and playing basketball related video games was just not in my DNA. But all that would change when Midway released NBA Jam. Originally released in 1993 by Midway, NBA Jam took the world by storm. Described as the highest earner in arcade amusement history, it collected over $1 billion in revenue even before the home console ports were released. The cabinet would allow for up to four players and the game was a fast-paced two-on-two basketball game with most of the rulebook thrown out, other than shot clock violations and goaltending. The pace would never let up and the urge to beat down teams and become the ultimate NBA champion meant pumping in quarters into the machine until you went home empty-handed. One of the most unique features of the game was the on-fire feature. Once a player hits three baskets in a row, he becomes on fire and has unlimited turbo, no goaltending, increased shooting ability, and this will continue until the other team scores. The balance between simulation and arcade gaming was perfect and NBA Jam would be a massive hit. Even non-basketball fans like myself absolutely loved the game. When the Super NES version released, I bought it day one and played it non-stop. It was a good conversion, but of course could not match the arcade, and I still love to play the arcade game above anything else. But there's one area of the game that has been heavily scrutinized, and that is the rubber banding. Rubber banding is an aspect of game design that restricts the margin between the winning and losing players, favoring the losing player and allowing them to catch up to the winning player by various methods. This is usually done by increasing percentages to help the losing player become more competitive. Rubber banding is not a new concept. The first game I remember it in was in Super Mario Kart on the Super NES. If you're way back in last place, there is a much better chance of scoring an item that allows you to catch up and pass opponents faster. If you're well into the lead, the chances of scoring items that boost your speed reduce. In arcades, many games use rubber banding methods to keep the gap between the player and the computer close. It's a fairly simple formula. If the game is too hard and you stand no chance of coming back, you'll look for another machine to play. Arcade machines are there to take your money. So the balance and the inclusion of rubber banding is extremely important to what makes a successful arcade game. NBA Jam has very apparent rubber banding in its code to keep scores close. To test this down 30 points as the Suns, I hit three three-point shots in a row from the distance of the court. But this is one of just many scenarios NBA Jam uses to keep the games competitive and I've known about this feature in the game for many years. So the rubber banding code in NBA Jam is quite legendary and it's something that I've wanted to dive into and analyze in a lot more detail. The great news is I was fortunate enough to get the chance to be able to do this. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at how the rubber banding works. I was curious enough that I was considering reverse engineering the ROMs to see how the rubber banding actually works. But as it turns out, I didn't even need to do this because in April of 2021, the source code of NBA Jam would be uploaded to GitHub. And this would give me a chance to discover all the different permutations when the losing team could come back and clinch a victory. And there are many different scenarios where this could occur. But to keep this simple, let's split up the rubber banding in two parts. Skill level computer assistance and everything else. In NBA Jam, every player is ranked in skill in four main categories. They are speed, three-point shots, dunking and defense. These values are defined in the code and are set in various ranges. As you can see, there are 11 different individual skill levels for dunking but 12 for three-point shots. There's also a breakdown of the various forms of defense that each have their own individual skill levels. Computer assistance in the game is turned on by default. What this does is adjust these stats based on how much the player is winning or losing by. And this will also apply for the computer-controlled player, also known as a drone. For example, 
If the game is tied, then there is no adjustment to player stats. If the player or drone is losing, a sliding scale is applied to increase percentage of a particular stat. Conversely, if the player is ahead by too much, those same stats are then reduced by the same percentage. This would be outlined by Mark Trammell, developer of NBA Jam, in a GDC conference classic game post-mortem NBA Jam in 2018. And you can see them in the middle, there's a zero. Uh, zero is when the score was tied. If the score is tied, then do no modification to your base number. But if you are losing, then it would slide to the left. I'm down by one point, two point. So we went all the way to down by 10 points. You can see a 25% uh, you know, additional add-on to the already 25% that was there for, say, in this example, a three-point shooting. Drone skill is not only applied when a team is winning or losing, it's also applied at every minute of the game clock. If we look at the code here, there is a function called drone adjust skill that applies a similar sliding scale based on the team relative to a number of minutes left on the game clock. And in general, drones become more aggressive with less time left if they are in a losing position. But as we can see, these adjustments are made on a team-by-team -team basis, and it's something that Mark Trammell and the team would tweak over iterations of the game to balance out teams based on their level of skill. Computer assistance can be disabled with a dip switch in the arcade cabinet, but many people, myself included, noticed that it doesn't really seem to change the rubber banding at all, and looking at the code does confirm this. This is because there is quite a few other scenarios that will apply and allow for the computer to catch up and win games at the buzzer no matter what. Win the game. Drone defense is a very important one and adjustments are applied regardless of CPU assistance. Adjustments are made in the following areas. Mode switching, Seek times, nasty mode, percentage to push or steal, and percentage to block. If we take blocking for example, there is a 14% increase in the drone skill level that it will block a shot if the scores are tied. But if the player is up by 15 points or more, it increases to 50%. For pushing or stealing, it's even worse. 6% if the game is tied, and 250% if the player has a 15 point or more lead and these percentages are applied on top of the NBA player's base skill level. It's not only drones that get adjustments. Players do as well, and this is an important part of the game to keep it entertaining and the scores as close as possible. Player shots are also affected in scenarios where the game clock is running down. This block of code is very well documented and walks through exactly what occurs. If the game is in the fourth quarter or overtime, with five seconds or less to go and the player is about to shoot, if the scores are tied, then no adjustments are made. If the shot taken would tie the game, regardless if it's a three-pointer or a two-pointer, then there is a 75% chance it will go in, regardless of distance of the shot. This is why we see some of those long distance three-point shots go in for baskets to either tie or close the gap right before the buzzer to end the quarter. If a player takes a shot that would win the game, then it will go in at least 30% of the time. And finally, if the shot taken would pull within one to two points, then it would go in 90% of the time. The code comment here says 90% of the time for max excitement without putting him ahead. If the game is in the first, second and third quarter, then similar things occur. However, these percentages are reduced. For example, the shot to tie the score will go in 40% of the time, the shot to put the game within one to two points would go in 50% of the time, and if the player is losing by a margin of four or more, then the shot will go in 60% of the time, regardless of shot distance. These adjustments to both player and drone are effectively the rubber banding that controls the game and they would be constantly tweaked after many playthroughs of both the developers and numerous location tests in the arcades. If we take this comment for example, if there's a 5% chance to land a basket, it hits almost 50% of the time. So the percentage was reduced to 25% to balance the game. 
and there is many of these areas in the code that I've still yet to discover. Beating a full four quarter game is difficult, but not impossible. Even with the CPU assistance turned off and the difficulty set to easy, it's very challenging. The best way to beat the computer is to try mount an early lead and hold it. It's challenging because the drone adjustment code will kick in and try to find their way back into a competitive position, then take victory right at the end of the game. There's also some other interesting areas of the game. If the player is down by two or more, you can't lob an air ball. If the player has thrown up four bricks, the next shot will always go in. And player shot percentage is adjusted by 2% per point if the player is losing and minus 2% per point if the player is winning. NBA Jam was criticized for its heavy handed rubber banding, but I personally think it's one of the main reasons that people kept coming back to try and outsmart the computer. Mark Tamel said that it was probably the most controversial part of the game. It's a fascinating look to browse through the source code and locate all the areas where drones and players can take an advantage. The odds are most certainly stacked against you. Beating the game requires skill and a lot of luck on your side, but there's no question that Midway and Mark Tamel made the right choice in balancing the game the way they did. If they changed the rubber banding to be something else, it may not have been as successful as what it was. So there you have it. Thanks to the source code that was made available on GitHub, we can now analyze the NBA Jam source code in a lot more detail and try to understand how the computer basically cheated in order to win games. And if you look at the source code and everything that we've talked about, the odds are very much against you. But there were some really skilled players out there that knew how to take advantage of these situations and end up beating the game. But for me, NBA Jam has always been a very challenging game and the rubber banding code really kind of plays a huge part in that. But I wanted to leave it here for this episode. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, don't forget to leave me a thumbs up and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.